cool. Shall we go ahead and get started? Um, telling by, by the turnout, everybody is super stoked to learn about web scraping. <laughs> um, so thanks everybody uh, for joining us today. Um, yeah, so thanks also to Andrew for being willing to uh, actually offering to do a series on web scraping. Um, so Andrew is uh, the lead data scientist at Exegetic Analytics, and I think it's probably time to hand over to him. Uh, unless we want to wait a minute for more people to join. It looks like people are still joining. Are you happy to get started, Andrew? Cool, go for it. Thanks so much. Hi, good evening. Um, there's something uniquely kind of weird and intimidating about chatting to people over the internet that I still haven't quite wrapped my head around, but um, we'll make the most of it. Um, Megan has kindly organized uh, this shortened URL and if you follow that, you will get to a page on GitHub that has uh, a couple of exercises on it. Um, and we'll be adding more exercises as, <clears throat> as we progress to the second, third, and fourth stages of, of the series. Um, there's also, in the readme file, uh, a link to a page with some setup instructions. Uh, so I think that, that, that was, those instructions were sent out earlier today, but if you didn't receive them, then you can grab them directly from that link. I wouldn't stress too much about getting set up for today because we're really going to be just covering kind of preliminaries uh, during the course of today's session. But it will be really useful if you got through those setup instructions before next week. And um, so the, the initial bits, installing R and installing R Studio and the packages should be fairly straightforward. Um, but then towards the end, there's the installation of Docker and Selenium, which potentially might be a little bit more challenging. Very happy to help you out if you get stuck um, with those as well. But you know, if you do get stuck, obviously let me know um, as soon as possible so that I have time to, to work you through that. Okay, so I'm gonna just close that. And maybe just a little bit of background about the, the plan for, for where we're going um, over the, the next um, four weeks. The, my, my vision for this is that today we're going to do some introductory things. So we're going to talk about the principles of, of web scraping in, in general terms. Then I'm going to <clears throat> show you a quick sort of end-to-end -end demo of going and extracting information from a web page ultimately stashing it into a database. And then we're going to proceed to talk about um, working with URLs, uh, because this is going to be a pretty fundamental component of any kind of web scraping project, because you're going to need to be able to navigate around the internet. And then finally, we'll talk about uh, using the WebShot package to kind of get a very simple a way of extracting information from the uh, from the internet by basically going and taking screenshots of individual web pages and we'll see how that can be automated to go and cover a whole series of of web pages and this will set up uh, a couple of concepts that we'll be using repeatedly um, over the next little while okay so um i think those are all the preliminaries that i needed to cover let's get started so uh Web scraping. Um, why, why are we interested in this? Well, ex at Exegetic, we spend quite a lot of time um, building uh, scrapers. And in fact, I would say probably 80% of, of what I do um, at Exegetic involves building scrapers. And we do that both in Python and in R. Um, being originally an R guy, definitely my preference is, is to use R for building scrapers, but at the same time, I have to acknowledge that there are some superb tools for, for doing web scraping in Python as well. Okay, so what is web scraping? Well, um, the idea behind web scraping is that you're going to build uh, a chunk of code that's going to go in and automatically or automatically um, extract data from a bunch of websites and then gather that information and store it in a structured format so that you can then use it for your own purposes. So for doing an analysis, for example. 
Um, so this then leads to the question of, well, <laughs> why would you want to do something like this? And th the reason is readily apparent, and that is that, that the internet, as I think we all know, um, is a host to a truly astronomical volume of, of information. And it's, it's very, very useful to be able to go and grab this information and have a copy of it locally or a copy of a subset of it locally so that you can actually do analyses with it. I see. I, I have just been informed that I'm not sharing my screen, which of course is going to really set this entire thing back and you'll be wondering what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> uh, these be the challenges. Okay, let me share my screen. You guys can all have a, like a little chuckle about me. It's all good. I guess I'm now sharing my screen. So I can get back to where I was previously. Um, <laughs> OK. So I've spoken about why you would want to do web scraping. And the next question is, well, uh, how would you go about doing this? And well, there are a couple of options. You could go and do this manually, right? You can actually go and visit each of the pages that you're interested in. You can literally go and like select the content on that page. and copy and paste it. And in fact, if you're if the thing that you're selecting is an HTML table, this actually works remarkably well because you can paste that directly into Excel and Excel understands the, the layout of the data in a, in a very nice way. But there, there are some downsides to this. If, if your data is only on a single page, then taking this approach is fairly straightforward because you've only got a single page that you, you need to attack. But if the information that you're looking for is distributed across a variety of pages, um, you know, tens or hundreds or perhaps even thousands of pages, then this manual approach is going to become uh, intractable and you're going to need to look at some way of, of automating the process. Okay, so how? How would you go about doing this? Well, if the site has an API, then this is definitely the preferred way to go. Basically, by exposing an API on a website, they are explicitly asking you to use the API to access their data. And it's pretty bad form to go and scrape a website if there is an API available. Not only is it bad form, but it's also very inefficient because generally an API will make your life really, really easy, whereas web scraping can be a little bit of work. Okay. If there's no API, well, then your only option is to go ahead and scrape the contents of that page. So how would you go about doing that? Well, there are a number of, of uh, scraping as a service sites, and this is a list of, of a couple of options. And these are, these are really a pretty good proposition um, for a number of reasons. Firstly, um, using one of these services is very, very quick and easy. Uh, you basically just describe what information you require from the web page, and then they will go off and harvest that information for you. And this is ideal if your project is really well specified. Uh, and in addition to this, many of these actually have a limited free tier, so you can basically use their service for, for nothing. But on the downside, um, you never actually get access to the scraper code. Uh, which means that you can't then go and tinker with the, the scraper. And in addition to this, um, very often you need to pay a subscription. And in other words, it's not just a once-off payment for the creation of the scraper, but you need to actually continue paying a subscription if you want to get updated data via the scraper. Um, if the site if the site that you're scraping changes, then inevitably you're going to be asked to pay for an update to the scraper. And generally, this is not, not really a, a very good approach if you're contemplating like a long-term scraping project. For like a once-off job, it works really, really nicely. But if it's something that you're going to be doing systematically for you know, days or weeks or months, then these services are not particularly good. So 
what are the alternatives then? Well, you're going to go and whip out the tools at your disposal and build your own scraper. And to my mind, there are really two dominant tools for building web scrapers, and those are R and Python. And as I've mentioned before, I'm a fan of, of both of these. They're both excellent tools for doing web scraping. What they will enable you to do is to navigate the, the components of, of the, the internet. And this is basically just a, a very simple schematic which indicates the system that we'll be tapping into when you build a, a web scraper. So what we've got over on the left-hand side here is a web server. So that's where the content that you're going to be scraping ultimately originates from. And when you visit uh, a, any website, um, typically there, there are three things that your browser will download from the web server. So the first of those is the HTML, which is this block in the middle, and that's really the content of the page. Then you've got the, the CSS, and the CSS tells your browser how to render that content on the page. So the CSS is what makes your web page look beautiful. And then finally, at the bottom here, we've got the, the JavaScript. And the JavaScript is JavaScript is code that actually executes in your browser. And, and here it's important to, to differentiate between two different sources of, of web page content. So you've got the, the statically rendered content. And this is um, material that's rendered into the HTML document on the server. So this data is then delivered directly from the server to the browser. And then you've got dynamically rendered content. And this is generated by JavaScript in your browser. In other words, locally on your computer. And this distinction between the, the static content and the dynamic content is really very important because it has a very enormous impact on, <laughs> on scraping because the statically rendered content is very, very easy to, to scrape because all of that content is delivered directly to the browser or directly to R or Python. Whereas the, the dynamic content actually requires the, the JavaScript to be executed on the page. And this means that you need to resort to uh, tools that es essentially uh, emulate what's happening inside a browser. And we'll be talking about that we're dealing with uh, dynamic content in the final uh, components of, of the series. OK, so what things do you need to know about? Well, you do need to know a little bit about HTML, because you're going to spend a lot of time navigating around the innards of a web page. So you need to know about like tags and and components of tags uh, in order to make sense of the web page. Do you need to know uh, CSS? Well, yes, you, you do need to know CSS, but only a limited component of CSS. So you need to understand the, the selectors in CSS, but you don't really need to understand the styling. In other words, you just need to know how your browser identifies components on the web page using CSS. And then finally, do you need to know JavaScript? Fortunately for me, because I know nothing about JavaScript, you don't. Although having just like a high level understanding of the basic principles of the language is going to be really useful to you as well. OK, so this is just throwing out a little challenge. Um, if, if you can think of websites that you would like to see scraped, um, then feel free to tweet them at me. And um, I will put together some uh, exercises or demos around them. And potentially, we'll be able to chat about them uh, in, in later installments of this series. OK, so let's take a look at how we can do some scraping. And the place that we're going to kick off is by looking at an end-to-end -end, uh, demo of crawling the private property website. OK, so I'm going to flip across to R now. And I've got a script here that I'm going to walk us through. Um, and I'm going to be basically flipping back and forth between this script here in R Studio and uh, the web page in, in the browser, just to illustrate um, 
essentially how we identify components on the page and then how we extract the, the corresponding information. Okay, so these are the, the functions that we're going to be using. So it basically boils down to just four functions uh, for the actual scraping. And those functions are all defined in the, the RVEST package. So obviously we'll be needing to load up uh, RVEST. We are also going to use URL tools for manipulating the components of the URL. We're going to use R SQL Lite for ultimately constructing a, uh, a SQL Lite database at the end. And then a couple of other packages that are going to be just handy for working with the data. So I'm going to load all of those up. And immediately after doing that, I'm going to set a, a global variable called scrape time, which is just going to record the time at which I'm executing the scrape. This is always a good idea. Um, and this is information that's going to be inserted into the database. If you're scraping a, a website periodically, then obviously it makes sense to keep track of just exactly when you did each of those individual scrapes. I'm going to set up a variable to store the, the name of the SQLite database and then create two variables. One of them is going to contain the, the base path. So path for the, the uh, private property site. And then the other is going to be the path to the, the search box or the search page. And we're going to concatenate those things together in a moment to create a, a fully qualified URL. And then we're going to go and take a look at that in the browser. So let me just define those. Um, and we're also going to pick out a, a location. And uh, I'm picking out my particular suburb. I live in Glenwood in, in Durban. So it's create a, a location variable. And we're now going to take these two components of the URL and basically glue them together to form a, a full URL. And I'm going to do that by starting off by creating a copy of the, the base URL. And then I'm going to use this path function from the URL tools package to append the path onto the end of the URL. And this is what we then end up with. And I'm going to take that across to my browser and open up that page on private property. Oh, this is not very encouraging, is it? Uh. Interesting. <laughs> I ran this just um, an hour or so ago, and it worked just fine. Uh, the demo gods are biting me in the bum right now. OK, let's just see. Um, I'm going to press on here and hope that this is just a curious artifact that's happening in my browser. I'm maintaining my optimism for the moment. OK, so I'm going to now add in a couple of prairie, a query parameters onto that URL. So we're going to specify a, a location and also a listing type. So the site has various different types of listings. So we'll append those onto the URL. So we've now got these query parameters added onto the end of the URL. And now the moment of truth, of course, which is going to determine whether or not this entire demo is broken or not, is to pull the data for that. And let's just take a look at that. Oh, it's impossible to tell from that. But what we can do is go down and see if any results were returned. Ha! Ah. Oh, that's great. OK, so despite the fact that it didn't open in my browser, it does seem to open <laughs> in R, which is good. OK, so maybe the demo gods are not completely stacked against me. Let me just try opening that in a in Firefox as an alternative. Let's see. One moment. Aha. Okay. So this is what that page looks like in the Firefox. So this is the information that we're going to be harvesting. So all of these property listings on the right hand side here are what we're going to be now scraping. And the information that we're going to be gathering are like the title 
for the home, uh, its price, its location, and some, some extra details. Okay, let's put that out of the way for the moment and get back to R. Okay, so um, we, we used the, the read HTML function to go and retrieve the, the contents of that web page and store that in a variable called HTML. And we're now able to start using the, the verbs from RVEST to actually extract content from that page. And the first one that we're going to use is HTML nodes. So there, there are two functions that, that are almost exactly the same, HTML node, and that will that will extract the first matching node or tag on the page. And then HTML nodes will extract all of the tags that match on the page. So we're wanting to extract all of the listings on the page. And the argument HTML nodes, this string is actually a CSS uh, selector. So we're looking for an A tag. Now, an A tag is just a, a hyperlink. And it's got a particular class. It's got this listing result class. Next week, we'll be talking about the, the details of, of CSS. So this will make a lot more sense um, then. Anyway, take this and we apply it to our, our web page. We store the results in results. And we can check how many results we got back. So there are 24 properties listed on that page. And this is what the actual structure of each of those tags looks like uh, on the page. So we've got this A tag, right, which is what we matched on with the CSS. And you can see that it's got this listing results class, which is what we specified as well in the CSS selector. And then within it, it's got these two div tags. And that's where the, the key information actually lies. Okay, so we're going to start off by focusing our attention on just one of these entries. We're going to build some code and basically work out the steps of getting the information that we want. And then we're going to generalize that and apply it to all of the, the results from that page. So I'm going to pick out the first result in the series. Okay. And you can see this is what the, the code looks like, what the HTML looks like. You've got those two embedded div tags, the one, the image holder, and the other, the info holder. And we're really going to be focusing our attention more on the info holder for the moment. Okay, our next thing is to, to use this HTML attribute uh, function, and we're going to be extracting the, the href attribute from the A tag. And here you can actually see it. There's the href, right? And that's giving us the link to the page for this specific property. So if I go and run that, I've now got the path for that particular property. But you'll notice that it's a relative path. In other words, it doesn't actually contain the, the domain. So it doesn't have the private property.co.za up front. We'll need to deal with that. But let's, let's see what else we can get. We're going to go and find a, a node, which has got the address class. And we're then going to take that node and pipe it into the HTML text function. And what HTML text does is it extracts the text content, which is contained within a tag. And we see that that one, this first listing is at uh, one Chelmford place, which is just up the road from me, actually. Um, we can then go and extract the price by looking for a tag that's got this price description class. And again, we pipe the results into HTML text so we can get the price. And we immediately see here that the price is not coming back as a number. Now, I would want to take this and convert it into a number before storing it in the database. So what I've written here is a little helper function, which is going to accept a price. And it's then going to use two functions from the stringer package. Firstly, it's going to replace the, the R for RANDs at the beginning of the price. It's going to replace that with the empty string. And then it's going to replace all occurrences of spaces, like between the millions and the thousands, um, with the empty string as well. And then finally, pipe it into as integer. So we'll get an integer value back. OK, so let's define that function. And now add it onto the end of this pipeline. And I now get back the, the house price as, as a number. OK, so we've worked out the steps uh, required to get all of the information that we need 
for a single property. And now I, what I want to do is generalize this across all of the, the properties. Um, so what we're going to firstly do is get the, the href attributes out of all of the, the A tags. Right? So we do that by taking our, our list of results, so the list of all the individual tags for the properties, and we're going to use the, the map uh, character function from the per package, and we're going to apply that. It's effectively going to be applying this HTML attribute function to each of the, the results in our result set and extracting the, the href tag attribute. So that's going to give us the, the URL for the particular property page. And we're then going to make it absolute by prepending the base URL. So we defined that base URL right at the beginning. So if I do that now, I will end up with a list of all of the links to the individual properties. And we're then going to go and basically repeat the stuff that we did up here for an individual property, but now using map to do it systematically across all the results. So we are mapping this function onto each of the results in our result set. And within that function, I'm creating a, a tibble that has a column for the title, price, type, suburb, and address. And if I execute that, and finally bind the results together, because we're ending up with a list of tibbles, which we then want to bind together into a single tibble, we should end up with uh, something that looks like this, right? So we've now got information for each of those properties laid out as a nice clean table. Um, what you'll see here is that the price column hasn't been converted yet. So we're going to do that, but there is one other thing that we should notice here and that, that something special happens if a property has been sold. And that is that, that the, the price for that property becomes sold. So we're going to handle that as well. We're going to take the information that we've just created and we're going to pipe it into a mutate. And within that mutate, we're going to create a, a Boolean field that's just going to be an indicator of whether or not a property has been sold already. So we'll compare the price column to the, the, the uh, string sold. And then based on whether or not a pri uh, property has been sold, we're either going to set the price to uh, NA, so the missing value, or to simply the price string. And then finally, we're going to call the clean price function. So just bear in mind here, the second to last entry was one that was sold. So if we run this now and take a look at the results again, we've now got the second to last one. The, the price is NA because the property is sold. And we can see here in the sold column that it's indicated as it has been sold. And we're going to do one last thing, and that is uh, extract the information for the images. So it'd be quite nice to have the, a link to the image for each of these properties. We're going to do this by going and grabbing the image tag from inside the, the div with the image holder class. And then we're going to pipe that into another function that's going to use the HTML attribute function to extract the, the source uh, URL for that, that image. If we do that, then we should now have a, a vector of all of the images for the individual properties. Now we're going to take all of that and consolidate it together into a single data frame and take a look in our studio. And there are our results, right? We've got the, the ID for the property, when we scraped it, the title, price, type, suburb, the address, if it's available, uh, image, link, Etc. Okay, which is which is pretty nice. Okay, so we've now got these data uh, available to us, and what we could do is uh, stash this locally as a CSV file or as an Excel file. But I think that the more sort of um, scalable approach would be to actually put this data into a database. And I don't want to have to set up MySQL or Postgres to do this. So I'm going to use SQLite, which I know is always going to be available on, on anyone's machine. So let's flip back to our script. We would start off by creating uh, a SQLite database. And we've given it this 
db name. db name is just the, the name of a local file on my computer. You can see it's got the SQLite extension. So that's going to set up the database. And a SQLite database is just a single file. All of the information, all the tables just get stuffed into that single file. And now what I'm going to do is essentially a, a little bit of, of normalization of my data. So I'm going to, from my results uh, table, I'm going to extract the, the time and the price. And what remains is the, the property table. So my thinking here is that the, the details of the property, all of its specifications, these are not going to change over time. So I'm going to have one table with just the property specifications. And then I'm going to have another table with the price specifications. And in principle, if I ran this scraper, let's say daily, then the property table would remain the same, but I'd be adding new entries to the price table every time I went back and checked the, the site. This could potentially become interesting because I'd be able to track how the prices of, of properties change over time. Okay, so what I'm now doing is checking whether that property type table already exists in the database. And if, if it does, then this is a little bit of fancy footwork to basically ensure that I'm not going to go and reinsert an existing property in the database. Since the database is brand new, that's not going to do anything. And I'm now writing the, the contents of my property table into a table in the database, also called property. And I've done that. And I'm also going to create a price table, which is going back to my results, but now pulling out the, the ID, the time, and the price. The ID is going to be important because that's going to enable us to link the price data back to the, the property data. So if I run that and stash that in the, the price table, and I'm then going to go and close the database. And now, Thanks to the magic of our studio, I can flip over to my terminal and go and open that database. So there's the database file, and I'm going to open it with SQLite 3, private property. There we go. First thing I'm going to do is just check on tables in the database. So it's dot tables tells me I've got a price table and a property table. And now I've got a couple of example queries here. So the first thing I can do is go and take a look at the property table. So select star from property. Uh, and I'm going to limit that to the first, let's say, uh, five entries. So there you can see, and I'm afraid this is getting a bit compressed because of my resolution. But we've got a table here. It's got an ID, column, title, type, suburb, etc. And here are the data for those first five entries. And we can do something similar for the, the price data. And of course, ideally, we want to be able to join those two things together. So we can do this by creating an inner join that's going to join the property data to the price data. And here I'm just pulling out the ID field, title, address, time, and the price. We can run that as well. So there's a little table basically summarizing the, the results that we've just crawled. Hmm. Interesting. I've obviously written this table twice because we're getting duplicate results there. Okay. So that was a very kind of brief run through of what a typical end-to-end -end, uh, crawling project would look like. And just to sort of pick out the salient bits, um, you will identify the, the page on the site that you need to crawl. You then need to uh, find the relevant bits of information. And for each of those bits of information, you need to somehow get a way to navigate to them on the page. And that's done by choosing the appropriate CSS selectors. And then you've got to write some code to go and extract that data from the, the page. Uh, and in my experience, a, a good workflow for this is focus on one particular element first, get that working, and then generalize to, to more elements. And then finally, once you've got that data, you're going to go and stash it in some form. Normally, a database is, is a good uh, approach. OK, so um, at this point, I think we can safely move on to topic number two. And that was talking about uh, 
URLs. And Astrid and Megan, uh, is it the idea is still to have a, a short break at roughly the, the half the halfway point? Uh, we can. Um, or if people maybe want to continue, then we can also I, continue. I, I, I am perfectly happy to let my mouth just keep on jiggling for the full time. Um, but okay, cool. I will forge ahead then. Okay, so let's talk about uh, URLs. Then I said, unless anybody objects, you have a minute or maybe twenty seconds to object. <laughs> <laughs> Your. <laughs> It's pretty strict. Okay, so you'll get back to me on the, the verdict then. Okay, yeah. so URLs are really important for, for web scraping because they are they are essentially the key that are, are going to enable you to get uh, to the information that you want. And they, they're they fairly simple, but there are some components of the URLs that just require a little bit of understanding. And there's some great tools in R for, for working with them. So let's start off by just talking about the anatomy of, of a URL and basically breaking it down into its various components. So up here, I've got a, a URL that's picking out a particular video on YouTube. And we can talk about all of the components that go into making up this URL. And we're starting off over on the left-hand side here with the protocol. And for the purposes of uh, web crawling, web scraping, the only two protocols that you're ever going to see are going to be HTTP and HTTPS, um, where the latter is definitely going to be uh, the predominant one. The difference between these two is that HTTP, the data is going back and forth in, in an unencrypted way, whereas with HTTPS, it's going to be uh, encrypted using SSL. For, for the purposes of web scraping, the protocol is really not important. You, you're not too fussed about whether the data is encrypted or not. The next component of your URL is the, the domain. And this essentially tells your browser or your scraper which server on the internet to go to in order to uh, get this information, right? Because behind the scenes, when you type in a, a domain name like this, like youtube.com into your browser, what happens is that that browser takes that domain name and submits it to a service called DNS, so the domain name service, and DNS will translate that domain name into an IP address, which is, I mean, IP4, uh, just four numbers. And those numbers then enable your browser to send that query to the right machine. Um, this domain is broken down into three components where the sort of the highest level component, the top level domain is on the right, so .com. And uh, this, these are basically, I, I don't know really how to explain like the, the, um, the logic behind these, but they're basically just ways of dividing the, the internet into kind of chunks. You know, you've got .com, which I think was originally supposed to be you know, companies. And then we've got um, sort of uh, country specific uh, top level domains like uh, co.za or co.uk. You've got uh, academic domains, all of those things, basically just dividing up websites into different classes. Then you've got uh, the actual domain, and this normally specifies like a particular organization or institute that owns the domain. And then you've got a, a subdomain. So any organization like YouTube, they can have multiple subdomains specified within their domain. And typically, every subdomain will map to a, a different physical server, although this is not necessarily the case. Okay, the next component is the port. And again, for web scraping purposes, this is not terribly important, but essentially what the port does is it specifies which service on the server is going to respond to your request. And Typically, there are only two ports that we're interested in. There's port 80, which is where your HTTP requests go, and port 443, which is where your HTTPS requests go. However, in neither of these cases do you actually need to specify the port. 
you'll only need to specify the port if the server that you're corresponding with uh, is using some non-standard port to serve the page. OK, next component is the path. So the, what we've got up till now, the protocol and the domain and the port have essentially taken our, our request and routed it to the right server on the internet. Now, once that request gets to that server, it still needs to know which page uh, or which service you're, you're looking for. And that's, this is where the, the path comes in. And you can think of this as very much like the, the, the folder structure um, on, on your computer. So typically, you might have multiple elements to this path. So you might have like slash search, slash watch, et cetera. And you can think of this as being directly analogous to the way that uh, files are organized on your file system. The website is laid out in exactly the same way. There's this kind of hierarchical structure of um, folders with pages within them. Then we've got query parameters. And these parameters will often be used to tell the, the website just exactly what chunk of information you're wanting to get back from a particular page. So in the context of this URL, we're going to YouTube. We're going to be watching something. And this query parameter tells YouTube which video it is that we're wanting to look at. So this is a, a unique hash, I guess, which identifies a particular um, video. The final component then of a URL is this anchor. And the anchor is also not terribly important for scraping purposes, but it's, it's pretty nice to understand how it works. What the anchor does is it's, now that we've got to the right server and we've got the right page, what the anchor does is it references a particular location on that page. And you'll very often see anchors like this used for example, if someone shares a link to Wikipedia and they don't want to only specify the page that they want you to look at, but they want to take you to a particular portion on that page, then they would add an anchor on to the end of the, the URL. OK, so those are the various parts of a URL. Um, now, let's flip over to R and get a little bit of an understanding about how we can go about manipulating URLs. And the main tool for doing this is the URL tools package. And I've got that installed, so I'm just going to load it up with the library URL tools. And then I'm going to take a look at the two kind of most important functions for my purposes. And those are URL pass and URL uh, compose. What URL pass does is takes a URL and passes it into the various components that we've just been talking about. So for example, this first URL, which is uh, a search query on Google, gets split up into a scheme, HTTPS, so it's secure. We've got the Google domain. There's no port specified. Uh, the path, it's slash search. Uh, so that's telling it what page we're looking for on Google. The query parameter is Q equals URL. So in other words, we're querying Google for tell me about URLs. And then there's finally uh, a fragment, which is referencing a particular location on that page. And the same principle applies to, to the second uh, URL here as well. The only real difference being that for the second one, we've uh, specified a, a port. Although in this case, port 80, this, is, uh, this doesn't actually yield any extra information. OK, so we've taken the URL and we've decomposed it into its various parts. And this is a useful thing to do because very often what you'll want to do is take the path and substitute another path, or take the query parameter and substitute a different query parameter. So being able to take a URL, explode it into its components is very handy. Now, that if you have those components and you've manipulated it in some way, you know, take them and reconstitute your URL. Well, this is done with the URL compose function. And what it's looking for is its, its argument needs to essentially look 
the same as the results that came back from the URL pass function. So it needs to be either a data frame or a list. And the data frame or list needs to have these various components. You need to specify all of those components, even if some of them are empty, for example, the fragment or the port. So here is an example where we have the scheme, the domain, the path, as well as the parameter, and we're using the URL compose function to knit those all back together again and give us a fully qualified uh, URL. Okay, taking a URL, decomposing it, perform some manipulations on it, uh, recompose it to uh, a URL. Okay, what about uh, particular accessor functions for components of the URL? Well, they're actually individual functions that allow you to retrieve and also set various components of the, the URL. And this, I think, is one of the, the most useful and, and beautiful features of <clears throat> R, and that is that you can use a function to retrieve information, but you can also assign to the results of that function. So this syntax still kind of blows my mind. And I think that for many other programmers who routinely use other languages, this would be just complete anathema. Like you just actually can't assign to the results of a function. But anyway, I digress. Um, we're starting off here with a URL for um, the, the root page on the English version of Wikipedia. And I'm running the, the scheme function to get back the, the scheme or the protocol. And we see that I've specified HTTP. So I'm asking for an, an unencrypted version of that page. I see I get back HTTP as the protocol. If I want to modify, update that to rather use the secure HTTPS, then I can again run the scheme function, but now assign HTTPS uh, to the result. And if we take a look at the resulting uh, URL, the, um, the protocol has been updated to HTTPS. So using these various functions, we're able to manipulate individual components of the URL. What about accessing URL parameters? And this is also a, a super handy thing to do because in many cases you'll be crawling and the different items that you're ending up crawling will be specified by URL parameters rather than components of the path. So we can use the param get function to get the parameters from the URL. So we're specifying the URL as well as the name of the parameter. And here you can see the, the parameters are the components after the question mark. And you can actually have multiple parameters specified for a URL. Each of the parameters is uh, separated by an ampersand sign. In this case, there's only one. And each individual parameter consists of a key value pair. So the key in this case is Q. Then you've got equals and the value uh, follows. So I'm asking back for, for the parameter value for the, the Q parameter and I get back web scraping. So in this case, I'm doing a search on Google for the term web scraping. And I can also use the param set function to go the other way around. And that is I have a URL and I want to modify one of the, um, one of the parameters. So here I'm setting the, uh, the Q or query parameter to web scraping in R. And you can see in the resulting uh, URL, the query has been replaced, replaced with that new query string. Now, you might be thinking, what are these plus signs in the URL all about? Hmm? Well, there's a very simple answer to that, and that is that um, spaces are not permitted in uh, a URL. So those plus signs are the way that those terms are kept separate, but also grouped together within a, a single uh, query parameter. But in addition to this rule of spaces not being permitted in, in URLs, there are a number of other rules that apply to URLs. And these are covered under the topic of URL encoding. So how can we take basically an arbitrary selection of, of characters and stuff them into a URL where that URL is actually 
only has a, a very limited range of permissible characters. You'll, you'll see what those are now. So these, between these two tables here, are the only characters that are allowed in a URL. Now, this seems potentially quite restrictive because um, you, know, you, you might want to, for example, submit a, a query to Google um, for a term that contains uh, some like, non-ASCII characters, like uh, a U umlaut, for example, or any kind of accented character. And as you can see, there are no accented characters in either of these sets of, of symbols. So how do we deal with this? Well, the system for, for dealing with exotic characters like that is called percent encoding. And basically what happens is that any exotic character like this C cedilla is encoded into uh, a UTF-8. Uh, so uh, it's basically a standard for capturing a very wide range of different, uh, different symbols. And when they're translated into UTF-8, that sing single character normally ends up occupying two bytes, right? ASCII, for example, can be contained in a single byte because there's just 250 or 256 characters. With UTF-8, you've got many more possible characters, hence two bytes required. Um, and in, in the case of this C cedilla, it gets translated into these two uh, bytes, which are here represented with their by hex values. And the way that that is then encoded into a URL is by using percent encoding that each of those hex values is then preceded by a percent. So we've got percent C3 followed by percent A7. That's those six ASCII characters now encode this single exotic character. And we see that there are actually two ways to arrive at this uh, URL encoding. The one is to use the URL encode function, which comes with base R, it's part of the utils package. And then you've got URL underscore encode, which comes with URL tools. And they give you essentially exactly the same results. The only difference being that in the case of URL tools, the hex values are in lowercase. Okay, so that's how we can encode these. What about going in the opposite direction? Well, there's a URL decode and URL underscore decode, and they will take a URL encoded URL, sorry, a percent encoded URL like this one or this one, and they will go in the opposite direction. So you can see we end up back with the, uh, the C cedilla. Okay. Uh, what about domain names? Well, if there are exotic characters in a domain name, then there is a, a slightly different way in which they are encoded. I'm not going to dwell on that for too long. I'm going to flip over to actually playing with these things in, in practice. And I'm going to go back to R for that purpose and just take a look at this uh, script. So this this exercise script, incidentally, is one of the, the two scripts that's contained in that, um, in that Git repository. So you're very welcome, if you've downloaded that, to just work along with me. Um, what we're going to do is start off by loading up the, the URL tools package. And then we're going to exercise a, a selection of functions. So load up URL tools. Um, we're going to take this rather long and obscure URL and assign it to this variable URL. And the first thing I want to do is just identify the various components of the URL. And I'm going to do this by site. So there's the protocol up front, HTTP. And then we've got the domain. We've got there's no port, but we do have a path. So this is going to the search page. And we then have a bunch of query parameters. So this is the actual the query string that's being submitted to that page. What we're going to do now is use the URL pass function to actually pass out the components of that URL. So URL pass and URL. And there you can see the various components of the, the URL. And there's our query string at the end, which is where all the, the really inf interesting information is contained. Now, 
The next thing I want to do here is change the scheme to HTTPS. Why do I want to do that? Well, if you take this uh, URL and you pop it into your browser, you'll get back the data, but you'll see that in the, in the, the toolbar of your browser, there's that nasty little sort of red lock that indicates that communication is insecure. That makes me feel a little bit uneasy. So I, I always prefer to use uh, HTTPS. So we can modify our URL by using the, the scheme function. So scheme URL, and we're gonna send, set that to uh, HTTPS. And we take a look at the URL now. The scheme has been modified to use SSL. And the final thing that we're going to do now is take a look at the decoding the, the URL parameters. And the first thing we need to do is actually get those parameters. So we're going to once again use URL pass uh, on that. And we're then going to want to get back the, the query components. Query. There's my query, and then I'm going to want to URL decode that. Why do I want to URL decode it? Well, because you can see that there are a number of URL encoded characters in the bottom in the body of that um, query. Many of these are actually spaces. Let's see what the remaining ones are. Okay, so you can see that we've got a couple of spaces in the query that have been encoded and also some double quotes that have been encoded as well. Okay, um, what about this? This is a bit more kind of a, a practical exercise and that is that I've got a selection of uh, paths to uh, various blog articles on the towardsdatascience.com domain. And what I want to do is take all of these paths and make them into fully fledged URLs. And I could definitely do this by just running paste, right? I could paste the, the protocol on the front and then I could paste the domain and the slash and then the, the path. But it makes a lot more sense to actually use some of the tools that we've seen uh, from URL tools. So I'm gonna use URL compose and I'm now going to need to provide it with some information to satisfy all of the, the various components that it requires. So I'm going to pass it a data frame, and that data frame, as we saw in the notes, or I mean in, in the slides at least, is going to have a bunch of components in it. And just to save me some typing, I'm going to just copy them across from another notebook. So there they are. So I've now created a data frame that's got a single scheme it's got the domain, which we specified up here, and no ports, no parameters, no fragments, but I specify that the path is going to be filled up from this paths vector. So if I define the paths vector and then create this data frame, I've now got the components of those three URLs, and if I then run URL compose over the results, I now get this series of, of URLs. This is, is a very important first step if you're going to be systematically navigating across a variety of different pages. So taking the, the, the uh, uh, relative URLs for those pages and concatenating them together with the domain to get a fully qualified URL. Okay, so I think we can now just proceed to the final topic, which is uh, taking screenshots. And screen, screenshots are... are they're pretty underrated um, because you know they they they're not going to give you sort of textual data that you or numeric data that you're able to analyze, but they do give you a a record of what a complete web page looked like at a at a moment in time, and this can be very very useful, especially for debugging a, a scraper. Like if you see that a scraper has stopped working at some stage and you've been creating screenshots of the pages that you've been scraping, it's very easy to go back and see how the structure of that page has changed over time and use that information to then update the way that your, your scraper works. Okay, so let's take a look. I've got a couple of slides uh, on this topic. Uh, let's talk about 
uh, creating screenshots or, or web shots. So this is the simplest way to record data uh, from a website. Uh, the package that we're going to use to do this is called uh, WebShot. So you should install WebShot as a starting point. And once you've got it installed, you then need to install another system called PhantomJS. And there's actually a function inside the WebShot package for doing this. So it's very straightforward, and it works across um, all operating systems. It's very neat. And what PhantomJS does is it basically provides a, a headless browser. So it, it, it has a browser that you're never actually going to see, but which operates like a browser in the background or for, for software purposes. So you, we're going to be able to send a URL to PhantomJS. It's going to go and retrieve all of the information. And this is both the static information and the dynamic information for that page. In other words, if there's JavaScript on a page, it's going to be rendered by PhantomJS. And then finally, WebShot is then, once the page is fully rendered, it's going to take a screenshot of that page and return the, the results to us. So let's take a look at how this works in practice. We start off by loading up the, the WebShot library. And we then take our first WebShot two bits of information that we need to provide here. The first is the URL, so what page are we looking at? And the second is the file that we want to save that WebShot to. So we're, I'm looking at the, the home page for the R project, and I'm saving the resulting file, and uh, I'm saving the resulting WebShot in a file called r.png. And this, on what you're seeing on the right-hand side here, is literally the WebShot that I've just downloaded um, from the R project in the course of creating these slides. Okay, there, there are a couple of further options that you can use with WebShots to just be a little bit more specific about the information that you're extracting. And the one is uh, the selector argument. And what you're specifying here is a CSS selector, which is going to enable you to just zoom in on a particular component of a web page. So I mean, supposing you've got this enormous web page, but you're only interested in a, a very small portion of it, if you can find the CSS selector for just the information that you're interested in, you use the selector argument, and the web shot that you get back will only be for that portion of the page. And then there's also the zoom parameter. And what zoom does is it actually just creates a file with progressively higher resolution. So the default zoom, zoom one, will give you back the information, but it's <laughs> the quality is not great. It's a little bit kind of, uh, it's chunky graphics. But if you go up to zoom two or zoom three, then the quality of that web shot becomes really, really good. Uh, and it's certainly something that you can then include in, into a presentation or even a publication. Okay. So let's um, give this web shot thing a try. And we're going to be focusing on the taking some web shots of the Deplier website. So let's pop across to, to R again. And here I have um, exercises for, for the web shot library. First thing we're going to need to do is actually load up web shots. So that was easy enough. And we're now going to jump through these hoops. So we're firstly going to take a, a screenshot just of the, the Deplier page. And we're then going to use the zoom parameter to create a, a higher res resolution or a better screenshot. And then finally, we're going to use the selector parameter to hone in on only a particular portion of that web page. Um, so let's just before we do any of that, take a look at our target site. So this is the page that we're going to be creating our web shots of, so the deplier site. All right. So there are a whole bunch of things on this. There's the, the cheat sheet graphics. There's all of this code. And it's a, it's a fairly long page. One of the components, so that file component where we're zooming in on particular details, we're going to be going and extracting this development status information from the bottom right-hand side here. So we're going to be just picking out only that portion of, of the page. So let's flip back here. Now, we're going to be using WebShot initially for 
creating uh, a web shot of the entire page. So we're going to do that by calling the web shot function. We need to give it two things. The first one is the URL that we're going to be targeting. And the second is the file name that we're going to be writing to. So I'm going to just call this deplier.ping. If I run that, give it a moment because it's downloading the page. It's rendering all of the components and then writing to a ping file. There it is. It's just appeared in my working directory. And if I open that up, then here is the web shot for that page, which I can zoom in on. And there you can see the content that we saw in the browser a moment ago. And as you can see, that the resolution is actually not too bad. Uh, it doesn't, get, doesn't degrade too badly as you zoom in but it does get a bit chunky and a bit fuzzy. So let's, as a next step, go and create a, a more high-res version of this. And we're going to do that by setting uh, zoom equals 2. And I'm going to call this supplier zoom. So the same thing is happening again. This, this, it's literally going and downloading the entire page again but now rendering it at higher resolution in the screenshot. And you can see that my file size has gone from just less than uh, 700K all the way up to just less than two megs. And if I open that file, which is going to take a little bit longer because it's a bit bigger. And now I'll zoom in on it. You can see that the, the quality of the, the graphics persists to a much higher zoom. So this is definitely a much more high quality, um, much more high quality web shot. So it depends on what your objectives are here. If you're just wanting to create a record of what was on the site, zoom equals one is probably quite sufficient. But if you're wanting to get something for like actually publishing, then you might want to have a, a higher level of zoom. Okay, the final thing that we're wanting to do is to zoom in on a particular component of that page. And we're going to do that using the selector argument. Uh, and here, the, the cheaters, we're going to go and look at the, the dev status class. But I'll, I'll show you how we arrive at that in just a moment. Um, I'm going to go and change the file name to dev. So, okay, so let's go and see how we arrive at this CSS selector. If we go back to our browser, and I'm going to use uh, developer tools, and you're going to see developer tools quite a lot next week. But for the moment, I'm just going to right click on this portion of the page and click inspect. And I might have to do that again. Oh, there, I've ended up in the right place. And what I'm looking for here is the enclosing div tag has a class of dev status. And that's the information that I need to target that portion of the page. Um, just to illustrate a little bit further, you can see as I navigate around the HTML on the right-hand side, the corresponding components of the page are highlighted. So they're the developers, uh, and there is the, the dev status. So this is the, the content that I'm looking for. So I'm going to take that dev status class, flip back into R, and here I'm going to specify the class. In order to specify a class in CSS, you need to precede it with a period. Again, we'll talk about that more uh, next week. So we run that. Again, the same delay because we're downloading the entire page yet again. But now uh, PhantomJS is going to focus on a particular portion of the page. You can see that the, the file size now is really quite small in comparison. It's only just a little bit more than 12K. And the resulting file is literally just that dev status that we were looking at a moment ago. OK, so those are the three basically different things that you can do with, with uh, web shots. Um, an entire page, an entire page at progressively higher zoom and focusing in on a specific portion of a page. OK, so I wanted to just throw in a couple of, of other kind of fun things to do. Um, the one I wanted to go and just like a practical real life example, supposing that I wanted to keep a, a record of what was on special at pick and pay from, from one day to the next. So what I might do is go to pick and pay and 
interesting. I'm gonna obviously have to put a other man up front. Yeah. Um, so this is taking me to the Pick and Pay website, and I'm going to find the page on which they list their specials. There it is. And what we then got to do is use this URL, and we're going to capture a web shot of what's on special at Pick and Pay today. So back here in R, I can do web shot and give it this. Uh, what I wanted. Let's go back to the browser. The URL again. There we go. And I'm going to call the resulting file uh, pick in a special stop ping. Run that. Phantom JS has got to go off, retrieve the contents of the page, and render it to that uh, PNG file. This is going to take a little while because, as you saw earlier, the pick and pay page actually is fairly slow to render. But if we're patient, we'll get our results. There we go. So here are our pick and pay specials. Right. So there's the page. Let's zoom in. We can see we've got two varieties of coffee on special, sugar, wheat bix, and bread. OK, so that was fun. I think, and useful. And the final thing that I wanted to do is um, show how we can automate getting web shots from a, a series of pages, because this is kind of converging on um, what we're going to be doing with sort of the systematic web scraping that we're going to be jumping into in, in two weeks' time. So this is going to have a lot of the, the common ingredients. And the, the page that we're going to be targeting is the the page on which the um, RStudio certified trainers are, are listed. So this is the page. And we're going to be picking out uh, the profiles for a couple of people listed on this page. For some reason, the entire page is not rendering. Let's see if I get rid of that. Ah, there we go. OK, so here are all the individual profiles for the, the many people who have now um, been through the certification process with RStudio. And what we're going to do is just visit um, a few individual pro profile pages uh, and retrieve that information. In principle, though, we could go and get all of the profiles from this page. So let's flip open one of those. So for, for Garrick, uh, Garrick will be one of the people that we target. So there he is. This is the page that we're wanting to, to grab. So we're going to set up um, a couple of things now um, in our studio. There we go. OK, so what I would do first is I'm going to store the, the base URL. Sorry. Doesn't include um, Garrick's name. I'm going to pop that into a string. And then I'm going to create a, a vector of strings that I'm going to be, like people who I'm going to be targeting. Uh, and I'm going to do this by going back to Chrome. So Garrick's going to be one of them. And let's uh, pick out a couple of other high profile R people. So maybe uh, Julia Silga and uh, Jenny Bryan. Uh, OK, so we've got Garrick. Let's pop him into this vector. So Garrick, and then Julia, and then Jenny. So there is Julia. So we'll get plus Julia. And then Jenny. Is both these ladies, incidentally, were uh, keynote speakers at the Saturday event that was in Cape Town four years ago. It's great to have them in the country. OK, so we set that up. We've got a vector of names. We've got the, the base URL. And now what we need to do is basically iterate over those things. So I'm going to have for name in names. And 
Um, okay, so one of the first things that, that is a really good practice when you, you're web scraping, especially if you're hitting up a bunch of pages, is that you should log what you are doing. So you know, the, the crawler will be doing a whole bunch of things in the background, but it's important to be able to see on a terminal the, the progress of the, the scraper because scrapers do get stuck and it's important to be able to identify that your scraper is stuck and it and needs um, some attention. So what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, some messaging commands. So I will say message um, retrieving page four and then name. I'll put a period at the end because I'm going to be pedantic about punctuation. Okay, so that's that's the messaging that we're expecting to see. And now what we want to do is create the, the URL for, whoops, that's not very promising. Oh, our studio, have you forsaken me? Well, let's just restart. Uh, not only does our studio not want to respond, it also doesn't want to die. Let's just be a little bit more aggressive about that. Restart our studio. Okay, hopefully we haven't lost too much in the process. Mm -hmm. Wrong project. Okay. Um. <laughs> oh, okay. So we're going to regather those names quickly. Sorry about this. Please bear with me. I'm going to just pop these into the other screen, which is going to make my life a little bit more efficient. So there's Jenny Bryan and Julia Soga and uh, Eric. And we're going to want to have the base URL as well. That. Okay, uh, and we're going to want to um, pull in the workshop library. So, oh my goodness, webshot. Okay, so back down here, we're going to define the base URL, define the names, and now we can set up our loop. So for name in names. Of course, you don't have to loop. You can also use like the tools from Per. You could walk over the, the vector. Um, and let's put in a message. Uh, so retrieving page four and name. Okay, and I'm going to want to define the URL for each of these. So the URL I'm going to create by just, I know that I have really robust tools in the URL tools package for doing this, but I'm going to do this the quick and dirty way. I'm going to use the paste function and I'm going to paste uh, the base URL onto the name. And so we can use that in our messaging as well. So it's going to be from and URL. So let's see if those results make sense. So who we're getting and where we're getting it from. Okay, and now we need to create a file name. So the file name, well, here I guess I'm going to be using the, the names of each of the people but I, I find these plus signs a little bit offensive, so I'm going to replace them. Let's figure out how we need to do that. So I'm going to use the g sub function. They're, they're functions in Stringer for doing precisely this. Um, pattern I'm looking for, the replacement, and the string that I'm replacing on, and I'm going to replace the plus signs with hyphens, and that should do the trick. Okay, so 
that is taking the name and replacing the plus my signs with hyphens. And I'm going to then append PNG onto the end of that. So paste zero uh, dots PNG. Okay. Um, and we can put that into our messaging as well. And it's going to go to a file called So, out. so there are file names, and all that then remains is to call webshot. So webshot uh, URL file name, and that seems to be doing everything that we need, right? We're building up the, the URL. We've got the file names. We've got a bit of logging going on, but there's one thing that's really important that's missing here, and that is to introduce a delay. So I'm going to have sys.sleep down here for three seconds. Why? Well, because it's generally good scraping practice to not go and hammer on a, a website, um, because this means that you're going to be degrading the performance of that website for all of the other people that want to access it. So normally, what you want to do is go and retrieve some information, then wait for a bit, and then go and retrieve some more, and then wait for a bit. Um, and you, know, you can use a, a static delay like this, or you can randomize it. Certainly, if you're wanting to remain below the radar, then randomizing your delay makes sense. But normally, if you're not doing anything too nefarious, then just using a, a static delay is perfectly fine. So let's put in another message here, just to indicate that we're waiting. OK, so we now should be able to run this and go and systematically get the, the pages for each of those people. And yep, there we go. So we've retrieved the first page for Jenny Bryan. We paused for a moment. We went back and got Julia Silga. Let's take a look at Jenny's page. So there she is, Jenny's page with all of her information. OK, and let's do the same for Julia, just to ensure that we are getting distinct pages. Uh, there's Julia's page. Etc. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, in principle, there's no reason why we shouldn't iterate over all of the, the people on that page and get this, this information for them. OK, Astrid, I think I'm done. Um, and since we still have a, a few minutes left, I'll be very happy to answer any questions. If anyone has questions and still has the energy to chat, Okay, so there was one question before we get into like more technical stuff. Your dope ASCII art. <laughs> oh, <laughs> hmm. now, I, I'm so happy you asked that question because um, actually earlier I was trying to remember where I got that ASCII art from. And well, there's, there's a very cool um, Unix utility for generating ASCII art like that. There are also a few mm -hmm. uh, websites that will do it for you as well. Offhand, I don't remember, but I have it scribbled down somewhere. Cool. That was a question from Vim, who is now smiling broadly in the chat. Um, yeah. We have another question from Sivu, uh, if you want to address that one. Um, will I find it in the chat? It's the second last chat. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. So, so Sivu asks whether, I could, whether you could just use like sample to, to generate a random delays. And for sure, that's, that's one way of doing it. You could also be like a little bit more um, scientific and like sample from a Poisson distribution if you wanted to get something with a bit of a shape and to make it look a little bit more organic. But that would be perfectly good. Yep, for sure. Awesome. Um, I had a question, um, or, yeah, a question. So you showed us how to iterate over URLs to obviously take web shots, but you can iterate over URLs to pull basically anything, right? You don't need to necessarily web shot. No. You could, you know, exactly what you did with the, the divs earlier, you could do something like that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the, the, real, the real powers and the real advantages of web scraping is that, you know, once you've, once you've developed a process that works for one page on a site. You can generally take that process and apply it to all of the similar pages on that site. Um, 
which is the, the principle behind one of the products that we're developing called Trundler. So Trundler is a system that's going and aggregating retail pricing data. And what it does is it visits a whole bunch of different on online retailers, and it extracts pricing information for all of the products that they're listing. listing. Uh, and it does that by essentially applying exactly the same procedure across every single product listing on those sites. Follow Trundler on Twitter, guys. It's really uh, fascinating to see how um, prices have been fluctuating, especially during lockdown. So <clears throat> my colleague Matt has been doing a lot of work on that and writing some pretty neat uh, blog posts. Uh, we've got one post where we're tracking the, the price of alcohol in South Africa, which obviously is a, a fairly topical issue. Um, and yeah, we've got some pretty interesting results. I mean, the price of alcohol rose steadily during lockdown, as, as I guess one would expect. But it's nice to actually, I mean, I don't know, you go into the shops and you have this kind of sneaking suspicion mm. that things are getting more expensive. It's great to be able to actually look at the data um, and you know, be sure that, that indeed inflation is real. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool. So do we have any other questions? Or if anybody wants to turn on their camera and wave, that would also be wonderful. Have you a polite <laughs> message for ethical scraping, asks Chris. Uh, yes, absolutely. So, I mean, one of the things that I haven't chatted about is the, the, the ethical aspect of things. And one of the first things that you can do is take into account that a site will probably have a, a robots.txt file. And that, that robots file essentially specifies which components of the site you are permitted to, to scrape. Um, and there's some, some very handy uh, R packages for, for dealing with that in a very neat way. Awesome. Cool. Hey, thanks, Anna. I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Go, for it. Go ahead. Um, in your experience, Andrew, how often do these websites change significantly in terms of structure? Like, how often do you have to update scrape? What are the realistic expectations you should have once we start? Uh, it's, it varies broadly. I mean, we have worked with some websites that have literally had the same structure for, for years, and there are others that change fairly frequently. But generally, sort of the, the extent of those uh, scrape of the, the extent of those changes is inversely proportional to their frequency. So you know, a website will completely change its structure maybe once every year or every second year, but they may make small tweaks to the layout of a page much more frequently. Um, and you know, w whether those changes are going to break your scraper depends very much on the way that you've written it um, and, and, and also you know, what information you're targeting on a page. Thanks. Uh, cool. We have another question from Irvold. Where can I look at the data you are scraping? Uh, do you do time series analysis and forecasting on this data? Um, so, Irvold, you can go and take a look at the, the trundler.dev site. So, I'll just pop it into the chat again. So, it's www.trundler.dev. Um, and that has it has, has links to the Trundler R package, which you can use to access the data. There's also a Python package called Trundler Pi, which is developed by my colleague Laura, who's also on this call. Um, and those, okay, those are ways that you can access the data. And then you, there's a blog on the site as well, which basically a couple of articles in which we've used the data for a variety of different analyses. Uh, with regards to your question of doing time series analysis and forecasting on those data, well, yes, for sure, you could definitely do that. But we are so busy building and maintaining scrapers that we actually haven't had a chance to do that. It would be awesome if someone did those kinds of analyses with our data. Cool. How do you deal um, with the 403 error? That's generally the website telling you that it doesn't want to talk to you anymore. Um, <laughs> And I mean, anyway, look, you, you can get the 403 error probably means that, that the website has detected that you, you are scraping and it's no longer going to be accepting requests from your IP address. And 
this this can be a transient thing. So if you you know if you wait and come back and scrape again in five minutes or maybe an hour, it's potentially that they've the case that they've unblocked you. Um, alternatively, you can set up uh, a network of proxies uh, and basically hit a site from a variety of different IP addresses. You can randomize your um, your browser string. These are all ways of kind of flying beneath the radar when web, web, web scraping. But having said all of that, I mean, you can get around it. But generally, when you are getting um, a 403 error, it's an indication that the site doesn't want to get scraped, uh, which probably suggests that you're doing something that might be considered uh, unethical. Um, Evolt, would you mind if, if, if you do? Yeah, please, by all means, that'd be absolutely great. And um, San Marie about using a VPN. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you mean about the VPN. I mean, the VPN will give you the ability to scrape from a different IP address. Um, so that's definitely an option. And for example, if you have a website that's not accessible from your particular from your particular location, then using a VPN to do that would be a good plan. Cool. So it's getting to um, you know our um, designated end <laughs> time. So. Uh, Maybe one more burning question, if anyone has one. Uh, otherwise, we will reconvene next week. Perfect. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone, for, for coming along this evening. It's uh, I, I don't know if you picked this up, but this is a topic that I'm really passionate about. And um, I hope that you've enjoyed and hope you've learned something. And I really hope to see you again next week. Well, there's one more burning question in the chat <laughs> uh, from Aditi. Probably I missed it. What happens if we have an API? What package should I look into? Oh, you should use HTTR. Cool. So HTTR has all of the, the verbs that you need to communicate with that API. I mean, normally you're just going to want to use GET, and that's fully supported in, in HTTR. So. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's been awesome spending the, the last hour and a half with you guys. Have a fantastic evening, and I look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. Cool. Cheers, Andrew. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Bye. everyone. For Cheers, guys. Mm -hmm.